Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing my top 40 books of 2019. Now, I haven't got all the books off my shelves, to be honest, because I don't necessarily own all of them still. Um, so I'm just going to go through my list as quickly as I can, just to give you the quick rundown. It's also in the description below, if you can't be bothered to stick around, I guess. And I'll give you a, a couple of words about each one. So these are created by, I do my quarterly wrap-ups. So my most recent one was quarter four of 2019 for October, November, December. And then for my top 40 books, I take each of the 10 books from my four quarterly wrap-ups and then give them an overall ranking. So let's get started. Okay, so at number 40 we have Film It Cuts, Sunshine and Lollipops. This is by Ollie Jacobs. It's an indie short story collection. There's actually a whole series of these books and I've read quite a few of them this year, but uh, it, this was my particular favourite of the Film It Cuts. At number 39 we have Pulp Fiction by Quentin Tarantino. This is literally the screenplay version of the movie, but it was quite an interesting read as well because it included a bunch of bonus scenes and and other things, for example, where the actors went off script or where rewrites occurred, so you could see both the final version and the draft version. And number 38, we have Cannery Row by John Steinbeck. I'm going to be honest, I read this towards the start of the year and don't really remember it, but I just always remember how Steinbeck makes me feel, and uh, yeah, I do want to get to more Steinbeck in 2020. And number 37 we have Dawn by Eli Weisel. So this is a uh, novel in his trilogy which has night, dawn and day. Basically they're all totally unrelated. Dawn is fictional and but it's about basically a young Israeli freedom fighter who's ordered to carry out the execution of a British soldier in retaliation for the Brits hanging uh, an Israeli soldier, or possibly a Palestinian, I'm sorry, I can't remember. At number 36 we have Death Note Black Edition, Volume 1 by Tsugumi Oba. This is the first of the uh, bind-ups of the Death Note manga, I guess. So it's about this high school kid, he finds what's called a Death Note, and basically he can write people's names in it and they will die in the way that he specifies. And he kind of becomes a vigilante. And yeah, the first, like, volume of it in the black edition uh, was my favourite of the lot. In at number 35 we have Small Steps by Louis Sakar. So Sakar wrote Holes and Small Steps follows the character called Armpit who was also in Holes. But basically it's a different story, it's kind of set more in the inner city and he comes upon this plan to buy and resell tickets to this sort of well-known pop artist who's coming to town. At 34 we have The Diabolical Club by Stephen Colgan. So this is a murder mystery, it's the second in his uh, series that basically they kind of tied in with this like fictitious detective novel writer who's reminiscent of Agatha Christie. So in the first one, A Murder to Die For, um, it takes place a, like, uh, I guess like a fate to commemorate her works. And in this one, at The Diabolical Club, it sort of follows an, uh, a missing manuscript. And it may or may not be based on some real life murders. At, and at number 33, we have a new Greek car, Faye Duvert. And this is um, a French BD, a band as Dessinaire. And uh, basically it's like a graphic novel. Basically what she did is she took a load of French newspaper headlines and then illustrated them. And yeah, I read it as, a, as an aid to learning French and it was good. The French can do satire quite well. <laughs> At number 32 we have The Miniaturist by Jesse Burton, so this is historical fiction set in Amsterdam and The Miniaturist uh, that the book is you know, named after basically makes small replicas of things for doll's houses and he's able to do these really in-depth replicas of this kind of upper class um, family's house in the middle of Amsterdam. So yeah, I love Amsterdam as a city as well so it was fantastic to you know journey there in the 17th century or so whenever it was set. And at number 31, we have Just Kids by Patti Smith. So this is a memoir about her earlier life and her love for a guy called Robert Mapplethorpe, who, he was an artist, she was a poet, and it basically follows their lives towards the end of the 80s, it's, and it basically follows their lives towards the end of the 60s and the start of the 70s, mostly in New York City. She went to Paris a little bit as well. And yeah, it was beautifully written, and I guess I was more interested in it because of the writing and the life that they lived, as opposed to who Patti Smith was, which kind of surprised me because I wanted to read it to get an insight into her as an artist and really she doesn't become an artist until after the book is over you know. At number 30 we have Alien by Alan Dean Foster so uh, Alan Dean Foster is quite a well-known science fiction and fantasy writer. Alien is his novelization of the movie of the same name but I actually think I enjoy the novelization more even though the movie came and the script was first you know but that's because Foster has just a fantastic imagination and his ability to capture details kind of really makes it leap off the page so for example he's talking about the smell that you get of the ruptured bowels when the alien kind of comes out the guy's stomach like that and um, yeah and also like he really kind of got across the 
the uh, claustrophobia, I guess, of them all being on this ship. Um, yeah, it doesn't really come across as much in the movies, but there's no space for them and no privacy whatsoever. At number 29, we have The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. I did a review of this one. I'll actually try and link below to any reviews I've done of any of these books. So there might be quite a few of them. Uh, this is my first ever read of it, and yeah, I'd watched the movies on Netflix and thought the movies were pretty good, and then read the books, and I'm kind of annoyed that I held out on them for so long because they de definitely are pretty good, and they still hold up to a read today. And even though, like... I guess I'm a, more of an old school Battle Royale fan because I read that about 10 years ago, 15 years ago maybe. Jesus, I'm old. <laughs> and um, yeah, so at the time that the Hunger Games were big, I wasn't, um, I didn't really want to get into them because I'd heard all this stuff about them ripping off Battle Royale. Not really true. There's maybe a similar premise, but uh, Suzanne Collins does a great job with her world building and I definitely think it's a, as a trilogy it's worth every reader reading at some point. At number 28 we have Space Ranger by Isaac Asimov. I can't remember too much about this either, but I remember it's about David Lucky Star and it's the first book in the series and basically he kind of gets this reputation as being a Space ra Ranger and then uh, he kind of has to live up to it, I guess. But yeah, just really cool sci-fi, very easy to read, and uh, I enjoyed it a lot. At number 27, we have The Mist in the Mirror by Susan Hill. This is uh, kind of very reminiscent to uh, The Woman in Black as well. They're both kind of Victorian horror novels, I guess, or like obviously not written in Victorian times, but set in Victorian times. So they, they're kind of historical fiction slash horror. Uh, as you can kind of guess from The Mist in the Mirror, this is a bit of a ghost story. Freak me out a lot because I have this thing about mirrors as well. I don't like them. So yeah, um, yeah, it was definitely worth a reading and I uh, would recommend, especially if you've read some Susan Hill before. At number 26, we have A Skin Full of Shadows by Frances Hardinge. So um, she also wrote... Oh, The Lie Tree, which I read earlier this year. Obviously, I thought this one was better than The, the Lie Tree. The Lie Tree did actually almost make it into the top 40, but just, just got, you know, pipped at the post, as it were. Um, and again, that's kind of historical fiction as well, with a little bit of horror, a little bit of middle grade in there. And this one is set during the Civil War, the English Civil War, um, between the Cavaliers and the Roundheads. And basically, it follows this young girl... And she's kind of taken in by this evil family, basically, who have the ability to put their ghosts into people's bodies. They're, like, using people as, like, vessels. And she realises that she's destined to become one of these vessels. In fact, she gets super freaked out because she realises that they're bathing her and checking her over for ticks and stuff. And they're only doing that to make sure that the body's in good condition for when she, you know, pops over to, uh for when she gets taken over by the ghosts. At number 25, we have Le Grand and Rochette, Snowpiercer Volume 2, The Explorers. This is the second book in the Snowpiercer graphic novel series. Basically what happened is that this French guy wrote the original one and then he died, so these guys sort of took over and continued the story. There's actually a third one as well, which I'll be reading soon. And uh, I've, been, I've lent these to my girlfriend as well, or given them to her, I don't really know. She has them anyway, I don't care too much because I'm downsizing my book collection, so I keep just being like, here, have some books. So uh, I think the first one was probably objectively the better one of the two but because she's seen the movie and we've talked a lot about the concept behind the the, the series so um, yeah reading the second one was a more interesting experience for me more engaging for me basically it's set on this post-apocalyptic train that's thundering through the wastelands and like you have like different classes so the further you go towards the engine the higher class you are and the higher status you have at number 24 we have Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe so this is an 18th century novel it basically gives us a lot of what we associate with the whole castaway and guy on a desert island thing I saw that Claudia at Spinster's Library recently read this one and really enjoyed it as well like there are some bits that are problematic in sort of today's sensibilities but again it is an old book and actually it holds up really well and it's kind of fascinating to read the survival tale especially when quite often not much is really happening you're just reading about him literally surviving so he's like putting up a fence and stuff but just the way he thinks and the way he conserves his resources I think is fascinating. At number 23 we have The Uncommon Reader by Alan Bennett. So this is basically a novel in which the British monarch, she, I don't think she's ever explicitly said that she's Queen Elizabeth but you know she is um, and she gets really into reading so in the end she sort of decides she wants to take up writing as well and like she's got a friend in the palace uh, who's like a footman or something who's helping her to get hold of the different books she wants and then he kind of gets reassigned because the people in the palace, people in power, you know, the people wielding power behind the throne or whatever, they don't want her getting ideas above her station, basically. And like, so she goes to a big ceremony, for example, and she's reading her book in the carriage and just waving like this while reading. And then she goes into, um, you know, Westminster Cathedral or whatever it is, Westminster Abbey, whatever. I don't know. I don't know monarchy stuff. Uh, 
<laughs> and she goes in there and then she goes back and someone's like hidden it from her so yeah it was a really interesting take I thought and um, definitely one worth reading and number 22 we have Rebellious Spirits by Ruth Ball so this is a non-fiction book it's basically about the history of uh, gin and like rum and rum running and all this stuff so it even covers part of the American Prohibition but it's mostly focused on Britain throughout the years and it's got these just fascinating real life stories of people from the 1700s who did some mad shit like one of the things was uh, like they used to have shipwrecks and so people would obviously go diving to try and find these bottles of rum because then they didn't have to pay the tax on it and obviously the tax man didn't like that very much so yeah it was just a really fascinating insight fascinating insightful read and Ruth Ball definitely did a lot of her homework it was one that I got sent for review and sat on for ages and didn't pick up and then when I finally got to it I thought it was excellent all right and number 21 we have the great fire of London by Samuel Pepys this was from the penguin little black classics box set that I had and uh, it is literally sections of Pepys' journal when he's writing about first the uh, Black Death, the plague, and then about the Great Fire of London. But I just found it fascinating and it's made me want to read his full diary, so that's one of my goals at some point to get to that. Then at number 20 we have The Day of the Triffids by John Wyndham. So this is, I guess, it's called kind of like ecological dystopian, I guess, like um, apocalyptic horror, uh, it's like a shooting star. Uh, anybody who watches this star goes blind and then at the same time the triffids these man-eating plants basically Descend upon the world. So it's like a zombie apocalypse except with zombie plants. It was fantastic Can't believe I've waited this long to watch it uh, to read it and um, Yeah, I probably will reread it at some point as well and number 19 we have Isaac Asimov's a whiff of death so this is a uh, detective story based on an American university slash college campus most people associate Asimov with his uh, sci-fi, but he did also write detective fiction and other genres as well. And I thought this was really well put together and a really engaging read, so uh, definitely enjoyed it. And if, you know, cosy mysteries are your kind of thing, but you also appreciate Asimov, definitely want to check out. And number 18, we have The Outsider by Stephen King. So this is, I guess, book number four in the Bill Hodges trilogy, which doesn't make any sense, but there you go. I did actually feel it was a bit weird how he kind of crowbarred Holly Gibney in. Um, she didn't really need to be in it as a character, and by the p point at which she got into the story, you've kind of got your established players by then, so I would have been happy just to keep those, you know? But I don't, I don't really think King's at his best when he's writing crime stuff, but however, even King not at his best is better than most. So, yeah. At number 17, we have The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. Not too much that I want to say about this one, really. It's Plath's only novel. She was a hell of a poet, hell of a novelist as well, and um, definitely one that you should read if, you, if you're into classics and mental illness. Yeah. At number 16, we have The Dhammapada by Anonymous. So this was also in the Little Black uh, Classics box set. And uh, yeah, this is like a Buddhist text. And I mean, I'm not religious in any way, but I do want to read some more religious texts to try and get more of an understanding of other people mainly and uh, yeah this is by far one of the best or most engaging religious texts I've ever come across and um, I will probably reread it this year and number 15 we have a dream catcher by Stephen King so uh, I read this as a buddy read with uh, Stacy stories I think her, her channel is I'll correct myself if I'm wrong I guess and yeah it was just a really engaging read uh, it was good to see sort of feel like uh, I was reading old school King again it's one of the ones I've had for a while and didn't get around to and um, yeah, there was just some cool stuff in there. Again, I did a full review, so I'll just link below to that. And number 14, we have Strange Weather by Joe Hill. This is four different novellas. The one that I liked the most was, I think it was called Loaded, uh, uh, particularly because of the ending of it. I thought it was a really brutal ending, which is my kind of ending, you know. Read these while I was on holiday during the sort of the summer, I guess. And uh, yeah, each one of them engaged me quite a lot. I think the third one, the one about the cloud, I wasn't as engaged in, but I did really appreciate the way it was put together. And uh, overall, yeah, just four cracking novellas. And number 13, we have The Mystery of the Three Quarters by Sophie Hanna. So this is a modern day author, basically, has been commissioned or approved or whatever by the Agatha Christie estate to write new Hercule Poirot novels. And uh, yeah, this was a mystery in which Poirot is confronted by four different people, each of them wanting to know why he accused them of murder, except he didn't accuse any of them murder. And uh, he ends up getting drawn into it, and I just thought it was a really cracking mystery. My kind of litmus test for it was that I think it would have held up even if it wasn't Poirot, and it was just her own 
murder mystery series, which she does write, so, uh, and she's won awards for them, so yeah, I was pleasantly surprised by it. And number 12, we have Socrates' Defense, so this is non-fiction, it's basically written by Plato uh, about Socrates, who was like his mentor, and the defense that Socrates gave when uh, he was put on trial for his life, accused of corrupting the youth of Athens. And in particular, I think Socrates' reaction after he was sentenced to death is just super poignant and very well spoken. And uh, one of my friends has recently picked this up, actually, because we just happened to be chatting and she said that she studied um, famous trials throughout history. And I was like, you should read Socrates' defense. So I'm yet to see what she thinks of it. But for me, yeah, it, it was very moving and very thought provoking. And number 11, we have Sleeping Beauties by Stephen King and Owen King. So uh, this is the first Owen King I've read. Basically, this was uh, what I wanted Insomnia to be and what Insomnia wasn't. Uh, basically, every uh, woman in the world, when they fall asleep, they start be kind of in, 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 they start becoming kind of entombed in this like chrysalis thing. And if you wake them up, they become super angry. And uh, so you get to see the effects of sleep deprivation because, for example, one of our characters is the local sheriff happens to be a woman and so she's fighting to stay awake you know and so you get to see the effects of insomnia which I really appreciated but you also get to see the effects of women on men and the importance of having women in our society as well so yeah full review link below definitely read it my other half read it and she enjoyed it as well and number 10 we have The Dark Half by Stephen King so this is one of his masterpieces and um, basically the, there's a writer in it and his alter ego kind of comes to life and starts hunting him down like and he can do things so for example the alter ego stabbed himself in the hand with a pen and then uh, the protagonist does the same thing very brutal scene again i reviewed this one so linked below uh, it's just one of stephen king's classics for a reason it's probably the best one of his books about a writer i think might even trump misery i'm not sure if not they're on a par for sure so definitely definitely glad i read it this year and number nine we have night by eli weisel so this is basically a holocaust memoir um, yeah, really enjoyed reading it and I went on to read, as you saw earlier, I read Dawn and I read Day as well, but Day wasn't very good. But um, Night definitely deserves its place in like literature and the official canon or whatever of books that we should all read. And uh, yeah, I'm surprised I hadn't come across it earlier to be honest, but very glad to have ticked it off. And number eight, we have High Rise by J.G. Ballard. This is kind of like a post-apocalyptic almost, or no, more dystopian, I guess, story about a bunch of residents. They live in this high-rise tower block, and eventually nobody is leaving this tower block, and all the different floors are waging war on each other, and it goes a bit nuts. I actually picked it up because my girlfriend was given a copy of it for her birthday by her housemate, and um, she was in the shower once, and I read like the introductory essay, and then was like, I'm going to have to read this book. So I did, and it ranked up here. And number seven, we have Shadows on the Tundra by Dalia grinka -Visuete. I think that's how you say it. I have no idea. This is a Lithuanian, I think. Lithuanian or Estonian. I remember she's not Latvian. Uh, uh, Non-fiction book. Basically, this uh, woman was a young girl during the war, and it, it kind of covers her deportation, basically. Her and her family being deport uh, deported to Siberia. And she actually wrote this manuscript about it and then buried it underground and it was discovered after her death and after the fall of the USSR. Almost didn't make it into print and my goodness, I'm glad it did because it was just, oh, yeah, definitely worth reading. And number six, we have Doom 94 by Yanis Yonevs. He is a Latvian author. I actually met him during my trip to Latvia last year. No, the year before now, 2018, I think it was. And uh, yeah, Doom 94 is basically a sort of semi-autobiographical coming of age story about Yanis and his friends. They get into the Doom metal scene and there's like drink and drugs and sex and all the stuff you'd expect from kind of a coming of age story. Felt very honestly written and I uh, really enjoyed reading it so you definitely would recommend. All right, that brings us on to our top five. So at number five, we have A Blip of the Screen by Terry Pratchett. This is a speech that he gave after being diagnosed with uh, the Alzheimer's disease which would eventually kill him. And he's talking about assisted suicide and his views on death and on life. And it's just a really heartwarming read. He actually de delivered it as a speech, I think. I think it was originally written to be a speech and ended up in this printed form and definitely just one I would recommend. I actually mentioned it in the end of life book tag recently as one that I'd want to read before I die. Reread. And number four, we have Boule de Feu by Anouk Ricard and Etienne Chez. This is a French graphic novel, Band des Dessinières, however you want to call it, basically follows a bunch of, uh, it's really hard to explain this plot because it's like, it's like an acid trip of a novel, but um, yeah, basically our good guys are trying to find Sage Patrice in the Boule de Feu to make sure that they're 
magical forest is okay. I'm really underselling it. You just watch my review of it. It was great. And number three, we have The Long Earth by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. For a long time, I thought this was going to be my favorite book of the year. And uh, I did like a 50 minute review of it back in the day. It's the first in a five book sci-fi series. And basically people are able to go from our earth to like the next earth and again and again in this like long sequence of different earths. Uh, but the other ones are all untouched. And so people start exploring, you get people traveling to the far west, etc. Just the way it's thought out and executed was so good, so good. Um, yeah, I definitely recommend reading it. And if you have the time, definitely check out my review below. And number two, we have Stephen King slash Richard Bachman, The Long Walk. This is uh, from the Bachman books. It's one of my favorite Stephen King novellas in general, I guess. And uh, also happens to be my girlfriend's one of her favorites as well, even though she keeps getting it confused with The Stand, which is funny because that's my favorite. And uh, yeah, basically it follows like a bunch of teenagers. They're forced to walk as far as they possibly can. If they fall down or fall behind, they get shot basically. And uh, yeah, it was very grim, but very like beautifully written. And I'm going to read it again this year. Which brings us to number one. Dun, 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 dun. So that would be Stoner by John Williams. I actually buddy read this with Mara from Books Like Whoa. She really enjoyed it, but I don't think it made it to her top books. It's really hard to explain what it's about in a way that makes it sound interesting because it's basically about the life of a fairly average American university slash college professor from birth to death. Um, but what's kind of so moving about it is what happens in his life and the way he responds to it. Uh, I would say it's pretty much the perfect novel, the way it's written, the way it's executed, and it helped that I had a beautiful edition of it as well. But um, yeah, 100% would recommend that one as well. Obviously, it is because it's my best book of the year, uh, and it joins... Last year's com last year's book was um, The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. So, yeah, probably read the two of those. They're both excellent. So there we have it. Those are my favourite books of 2019. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.